Good morning. I am your host, Facundo Batista, and together with Richard Young and Lena Afeyan, we have organized this MIT course on COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, and the pandemic. And on behalf of the three of us, thank you very much for joining today. As you know, the, course of, the purpose of this course is to learn what we know about this virus and the pandemic from leading science. In our previous lectures, we have been just scratching the surface on the critical role of antibodies can play during the responses against the virus or in the case of a successful vaccine. How important are for diagnostics and the potential that they hold on therapeutics. Today, we will be learning more about antibody responses to COVID-19 and the lymphocytes that produce them by a true leader in the field. It is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker of today, Professor Michel Snusenzweig, a scientist that I much admire and a wonderful colleague. Michel holds the Sandville Kohn and Ralph Steinman Chair of Immunology at the prestigious Rockefeller University, where he has joined in the 1990 and began tenure faculty in 1996. Throughout his highly productive scientific career, Michel has done seminal contributions. His discoveries have significantly changed our understanding of the field. Michel contributions are, for example, broad in the case of broadly neutralizing antibodies that has informed the HIV vaccine field and the process for treatments. More recently, Michel has also taken the leadership of informing our understanding on antibody responses against COVID-19. Not surprised, Michel has published more than 350 research articles in prestigious journals. He's a long-standing Howard Hughes investigator a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, a member of the US National Academy of Medicine, and a member of the US National Academy of Science. So thank you very much, Michelle, for joining us today, and we are all looking very much forward to your talk. Thank you, Papundo, it's a pleasure. Um, and it's wonderful that you and your colleagues are putting this uh, terrific course together uh, for the students and for really for everybody else. What I'm gonna do today, <clears throat> And what I'm gonna tell you about uh, is the product of work that's been done in a whole group of labs, uh, working together, collaborating together, really an army of scientists uh, on this uh, coronavirus uh, problem. Before I do that, I'm going to introduce you to some basic concepts in immunology. Uh, I understand I'm the first immunologist to speak uh, in this course. Uh, and those basic concepts underpin all of the vaccine efforts uh, that are uh, currently ongoing. So let's get started with that uh, with, at a very, very simple level, and then we're going to uh, get a, a lot more sophisticated um, relatively quickly. Okay, so to begin, um, what's the immune system? And uh, what are the key properties of, of the immune system? Well, there's really uh, three things uh, that all immune systems have uh, and that are uh, the absolute keys to, to vaccines. They have specificity. That means they can see things uh, in a very specific manner. If you're challenged with something, you'll respond to that one thing, but you won't be immune to something else. They have diversity. And diversity means that you can be challenged with a lot of different things, uh, a universe of pathogens, and be able to see them. And memory, which is very important for vaccines, means that when you're challenged a second time, well, you'll do a better job uh, in responding to the pathogen. All right, so. Um, how does the immune system do this? How does it uh, have all of these three properties? Well, there was a theoretical construct that was put together really quite some time ago uh, by uh, Burnett, Lederberg, and Talmadge that tried to explain these properties in a very simple way. What they said was that the immune system is composed of individual clones of cells many, many different cells, which are different from each other by their specific receptors. So you get two things from that. 
you get diversity because there are many different cells and you get specificity because each cell has a separate receptor which is specific for the pathogen, the virus, and what we call antigen, which encompasses all different things um, like viruses and, and bacteria. Now in this construct, what they said was that these clones have a predetermined receptor. And when a virus, an antigen, comes into the system, then the cell that has the receptor that recognizes it will expand, undergo clonal expansion. And that takes care of memory because what that means is that when you get the pathogen coming back a second time, well, you already have a bigger clone of cells, more cells that can see the thing. So it's really very simple in terms of uh, understanding what the immune system does. And this basic construct is correct in many, many respects. So if you just remember this, um, you know a lot of immunology. Now, how do you get that uh, level of diversity? So we know that we only have uh, a few thousand genes uh, in our genome. How is it that you can have enough diverse receptors to recognize everything? Well, uh, it turns out that you don't encode these receptors in the genome, but you create them. And cells of the immune system create them as they develop. Uh, and they do this by putting together bits and pieces of genome to create individual receptors. So you get a lot of diversity because you can randomly put together these different pieces. And there's an additional bit of diversity that comes because the junctions putting these things together are not exact. And sometimes there's a little bit of chewing back on the DNA or putting nucleotides in so that you can have a great deal of diversity, more diversity, in fact, than the number of lymphocytes uh, that are in your body. So that takes care of, of the diversity problem. And this reaction was, in fact, discovered by an MIT professor, Susumu Tonagawa. Now, there's one thing that this uh, construct does not explain, and that's a discovery made by another MIT professor, Herman Eisen. Uh, and what Eisen discovered uh, in the 60s, actually, was that the affinity of antibodies increases during an immune response so that you get better antibodies uh, in a very short period of time after you're immunized. And that can't really be explained uh, by the so-called clonal selection theory. So how does that happen? Well, um, it turns out that when lymphocytes start undergoing uh, clonal expansion, um, as proposed by Burnett and Talmadge, they do something that's completely crazy. They begin to mutate themselves, and they begin to mutate their receptors. So all of those receptors that are, were in the previous slides that get put together randomly <clears throat> get an additional bit of diversification when they undergo clonal expansion. Um, and that happens uh, in these structures uh, called germinal centers. So two things happen during clonal expansion to be lymphocytes. They grow as a clone and they mutate their receptors. Now this thing happens in these beautiful structures that are found in lymphoid organs that are pictured here called germinal centers. And you'll probably hear more about this um, uh, from Shiv Palai, but they have two zones, a light zone and a dark zone. And uh, the light zone in pink there, that's where the antigen or the virus is held in immune complexes for the lymphocytes to see. Now, we can summarize this um, modification to this uh, clonal selection theory this way. 
you have clones of cells. Each has individual receptors. Each one is specific for a given antigen. When you get an immune response, you get clonal expansion. And the clones each are a little bit different from each other. The cells in the, in the expanded clone are a little bit different from each other because their receptors have been mutated. And in the germinal center, you get selection for lymphocytes with high affinity. That's how you get a good immune response. Now, the mutations, uh, that's something very simple uh, in terms of its biochemistry. Uh, it's a cytidine deaminase that does this AID, and it just changes cytosine to uracil, creates a mismatch in DNA, and that mismatch is then processed by cellular enzymes to produce somatic mutations, gene conversions, class switch recombination, which we won't talk about, and can be harmful uh, and cause things like chromosome translocation, off-target mutations, which are the cause of most human B cell cancers. So this enzyme is great because it diversifies the antigen receptors and produces good antibodies, but it's also a dangerous thing because it can cause cancers. It's an important thing to make these mutations. So uh, they're point mutations. You might think, well, in an antibody, maybe that doesn't make any difference. But in fact, these point mutations are essential for creating high affinity active antibodies. And you can see that here, the top of this slide are um, several different antibodies. And these are SPR traces that measure affinities. And you can see the traces there for all of these different antibodies. If you take away their mutations, so-called germline, you can see that the traces also go away, which means that their binding properties go away. And more importantly, if they're neutralizing antibodies, in this case to HIV, all of their neutralizing activity goes away. So the mutations are really critical for creating good antibodies in this case. Mutations are focused. And they happen in the parts of the antibody that actually see the antigen or the virus, which are these little green loops up here. And the reason that they're focused there has to do with what the enzyme AID wants to see. Now, I want to just go over a model that um, my colleagues and I, and my colleagues, when I say my colleagues, I mean, a lot of different scientists, including your host, Facundo Batista, uh, are responsible um, for putting together for how this germinal center works. Okay, so there are two zones, a light zone and a dark zone. And the work is separated in these two zones so that uh, cell division occurs in the dark zone. And that's where the lymphocytes also undergo mutation they then move. So this is a dynamic environment. So after they finished their mutations and divisions, the clonal expansion, they migrate to the light zone. Light zone was that pink stuff that I showed you on a previous slide where the antigen is captured. And it's there, sorry, it's there that they meet the antigen. They take up the antigen and they communicate with T lymphocytes, which are in the light zone, and that tell the B cell that it's either going to go back and repeat another cycle of division and mutation or not. Um, and the cells that are succeeding, small number of cells that are succeeding are further amplified. So you can see that through iterative cycles of division, mutation, selection based on antigen binding that you would rapidly develop high affinity antibodies. And that's how this, this reaction is thought to occur. Now there are two products of this reaction. One product is a memory B cell and another product is a plasma cell. The plasma cell is a factory that produces antibodies uh, and it's, in fact, uh, what's 
responsible uh, for long-acting uh, vaccines that are effective. So these cells live in the bone marrow, present for a very long time, and continue to produce antibodies that can be protective. So there's very strong selection in the germinal center for plasma cells with high affinity. Once you get a cell that has high affinity in the germinal center, it can become uh, a plasma cell. Memory, which is the second product of the germinal center, is a little different. Um, the cells that come out to become memory cells are very diverse, in fact, with a few of them having high affinity, but many more of them having little mutations which are not necessarily selected for their affinity. And these cells act as a storage department, if you will, um, a catalog of things that might actually happen. They are cells that could be ready for pathogens which are just slightly different. All right, so that's background. And I just wanna say a couple of words about why um, people were ready, people like us, uh, labs like ours, we're ready for this uh, corona problem and advance the antibody discovery very quickly. But we had been working uh, for actually quite some time on um, the HIV problem and particularly interested in why we have no vaccine and uh, no cure after so many years. And essentially uh, vaccines, nearly all vaccines are antibody mediated. So why were we not able to create antibodies uh, to HIV that could be effective by vaccination? So it had been known when we became interested in this, which wasn't that long ago, it had been known that some people can actually make good antibodies. They're rare, these people, and they have very strange immune responses that instead of, la instead of maturing in a couple of weeks, as we can see for coronaviruses, took two or three years. So real mystery about how these people created the antibodies that they have. And so what we did was to develop a method for finding the cells that were producing these antibodies. Okay, and we did this in the following way. We found those people with the help of um, a lot of different uh, physician scientists, including Bruce Walker um, at, at the Reagan Institute, which really got us interested in this. So together with Bruce and others, we recruited these people. Um, and then we had to find ways of isolating the cells, the B lymphocytes, the clones of lymphocytes that actually had the receptors that could see the virus. And we did this by saying, okay, look, we know what the target should be. The target should be the surface protein on the virus that helps it get into cells. So let's take that protein, label it, mix it with the lymphocytes, and the ones that should bind it should be visible by flow cytometry. And if we can see them, we can isolate them. If we can isolate them as single cells, we can do molecular biology and clone the antibodies. So that's exactly what we did. And what happened is that we found many, many antibodies that are very, very potent, which hadn't been found before. And then these methods were adapted by just about everybody in the field, and they too discovered many very potent antibodies. And these have been advanced through preclinical and clinical studies. Now there are 60 different trials with monoclonal antibodies, trying to explore what these antibodies uh, can do in humans. We've done several of those trials at Rockefeller, but many other people are doing them, including very, very large trials. All right, so let's, with that background, let's get to coronavirus. So coronavirus, you've already heard quite a bit about. It has a spike protein that helps get it into cells. And it's got a life cycle uh, that you've also heard quite a bit about how it gets into cells, how it makes 
uh, replicates of itself and, and eventually is, is pathogenic. So what antibodies are going to want to do, or what we are going to want antibodies to do, both in a vaccine uh, and uh, if just uh, transferred, is to interfere with the binding of the virus to the cell. And the part of the virus uh, that binds to cells is called the receptor binding domain. It's in red in this slide. And what's shown here in this picture is the interaction with the receptor binding domain and the receptor on the cell, which is ACE2. So what we wanted to look for was antibodies that would interfere with this particular reaction, the binding of ACE2 to the RBD, because those kinds of antibodies should be the antibodies that would stop the virus from entering cells. So that's what we want the antibody to do. All right, so what we did um, almost immediately after um, the coronavirus um, emerged was to set up a program to um, see volunteers at Rockefeller University. Um, and we really got this going off the ground on April 1st. We were very fortunate, a lot of people volunteered. Uh, we screened over 2,000 people um, and eventually had 148 people come to Rockefeller to donate uh, blood. And we began to uh, just analyze those samples at first uh, to see what kind of immune response these people were having. So on this slide, what you see is some controls in black lines on the left, um, and then a whole bunch of samples, 148 samples, people, serum or plasma, antibodies binding to the RBD. And on the right side of the slide is a summary of the magnitude of those responses. And what you see there is that um, certainly we could detect these responses, but they were not really very strong. Now we didn't just wanna see binding, we wanted to see neutralization. Uh, that's the key to a vaccine. So um, this work, which was done um, in uh, Paul B. Nash's lab by um, Fabian Schmidt and um, other postdocs, uh, Frau Kamuch in, in particular, uh, shows you how we uh, produced uh, a neutralizing uh, detector, essentially. Um, what was done was to insert the SARS corona spike protein into an HIV uh, pseudovirus, which had in it uh, a nanoluciferase indicator um, so that we could actually see enzymatically uh, when the virus was going into cells <clears throat> and when this was blocked. And this assay has um, a great deal of sensitivity, several orders of magnitude of sensitivity, which makes it a terrific assay, rapid and terrific assay uh, for measuring and neutralizing responses. And this assay uh, shown in both of these graphs uh, is very, very strongly correlated with authentic SARS neutraliz neutralizing responses, both in plasma and for monoclonal antibodies. So we could feel very sure about uh, the results that we got. These experiments were done in Charlie Rice's lab. So this graph shows you what we found. Uh, the top 60 individuals are shown here out of the 148. And what is um, actually quite dramatic about this is that only the top 30 people had neutralizing responses, which were greater than one to a thousand. The bottom part um, uh, of this cohort is, is not shown here and fully 30% of them 
were below our level of detection, which was one to 50, so very low. Now the mechanism by which the antibodies uh, was neutralizing um, was beginning to become apparent right away. Uh, so antibodies have two arms, that's shown on the bottom uh, as IgG, but you can digest them and make them into single arm structures. Uh, and when you do that, what happens is that they lose a great deal of the neutralizing activity shown in this graph for several individuals, all of the individuals that we assayed this way. So binding with both arms is critical. And um, why that is, is illustrated here. It has to do with something called apparent affinity or avidity. Um, when you're holding on with both arms um, and you let go with one, well, you're still holding on. But if you're holding on with just one arm and you let go, well, then it's gone. Um, so Elmo here, uh, if he's um, holding on with both arms and he lets go of one, well, he's still holding on. But if Elmo were holding on with just one arm and he let go, well, that would be the end of that. And, and this, this really has some implications for any drug that you want to use to block entry or any antibody. Um, it means that uh, the spikes uh, on this virus are close enough or the trimers are configured in such a way uh, that it, it makes a very big difference uh, if, if you hit it uh, with two at a time. All right, so what did we learn from serology? Well, low levels of um, anti-RBD antibodies, low levels of neutralization in most infected individuals, and cross-linking that was really required for optimal neutralizing activity. What about some of the clinical uh, correlates? Well, um, you know, one thing that was uh, immediately apparent uh, shown on the left is that anti-RBD antibodies were a very good correlate for neutralizing activity. So if you really wanted to collect plasma, for example, for therapy, uh, and you didn't want to do a neutralization assay, which is more sophisticated, well, you could do an anti-RBD binding assay uh, as a correlate. The other thing that was uh, readily apparent is hospitalized people had better titers, and women had lower titers than men. How do we explain all that? Well, it's it really all of these variables are fairly codependent. So neutralizing activity correlates with the duration of symptoms, the severity of symptoms, and the age. So if you're older, typically you have a longer, more severe course. Men, which have a worse course than women, also had higher neutralizing activity. And hospitalized people, which have a more severe course, also have higher neutralizing activity. All of that means that if the immune system is exposed to the antigen for a longer period of time or more antigen, you're getting a better response. So it all makes some sense within the construct of immunity that we think about. There were also one interesting feature is that IgA, which is a different isotype than IgG and present in the mucosa, um, uh, generally was higher in individuals that had mucosal symptoms. This makes some sense as well. All right, so what about the antibodies? What can we learn uh, from the antibodies? So we selected six people, the shown in stars, and these are people with diverse responses, and went ahead to cloning their antibodies. And we did it using the bait, which was the RBD. So again, we're interested in the part of the virus that actually is talking to the cell. Uh, and we use that as a bait and take the blood cells, mix them with the protein, identify the cells that are binding to the protein, sort them using a cell sorter, and then do molecular biology to recreate the antibodies. Again, it's the RBD that's the bait because that's what's interesting. And here's what we saw in the flow cytometer. So 
what we're looking at in the control is that we don't really see any cells that bind to the RBD, shown here in the oval. Um, but in all of the patients, we see different numbers of cells, usually very few cells, that are in fact binding to the RBD. If we go ahead and clone them, each pie chart is an individual. The number in the middle is the number of antibodies, and each slice represents one of those expanded clones from Burnett. The colors are nearly identical antibodies. So everybody's got clones, and many of the antibodies are shared. Different people, similar antibodies. They're solving the problem in the very same way. And that is something that we saw initially for HIV and that everybody else subsequently saw and that we've seen for many human diseases, uh, responses to many human diseases. It turns out, you know, you would think that there's enough diversity that you'd never see this, but in fact, there are not that many solutions. Now, we also got antibodies that were very, very potent. So here you can see antibodies that neutralize uh, um, IC50, so 50% 50 um, neutralizing uh, at concentrations that are at nanograms or picomolar uh, concentrations. So extremely potent. What did we learn from the cloning? Potent antibodies are found in just about everybody. B cells making them are rare. They have low levels of somatic mutation. That's different from HIV, for example. Um, and it's a good thing because it means that you don't have to do a lot of running around in the germinal center to find a good solution. Nearly identical antibodies in different people, so everybody can do this. Certain antibodies are overrepresented. And um, I didn't have time to show you that IgA is particularly good uh, at neutralizing. And that is likely because it's an even better crosslinker than IgG. It also helps explain why some mucosally delivered vaccines are better than systemically delivered vaccines. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the mechanism um, and, and how these antibodies neutralize. So this is um, structural data uh, that comes from our collaborators at Caltech. In fact, Christopher Barnes, a terrific postdoctoral fellow in Palmer of Yorkman's lab. So here is the RBD in gray. And um, what you can see is that um, uh, this particular group of antibodies, so there, Christopher has been able to uh, group the antibodies into four different categories. That's important because some of these antibodies are complementary to each other. This particular type of antibody sees the RBD very similarly to um, ACE. It binds only when the RBD is in the up configuration, just like ACE2. And it binds exactly to the same ridge as ACE2, and it blocks it directly. Um, it's overrepresented because unlike VDJ recombination to generate the majority of the binding energy, this particular group of antibodies uses germline encoded, so the other CDRs, CDR one and two for the experts, uh, to make the majority of the contacts. A second group of antibodies, and this is really an amazing kind of antibody, um, sees, the R sees two adjacent RBDs. So the trimer is three part the same. So there are three RBDs on a trimer. And what you see here is that this antibody sees the ACE binding ridge, yes, blocks ACE because it sees the ridge, but then it sees the next door neighbor as well. And it does that by inserting a loop that's hydrophobic right into the next door neighbor. And what that does 
is it locks down the RBD. So the RBD is blocked by this antibody in two ways. It's blocked because it binds exactly where ACE binds, but it also locks down the RBD so that the cannot go up and be recognized by ACE. So this category is a particularly potent kind of antibody because it has two different mechanisms of interference. And finally, there's a third category that binds outside of the ACE binding site. And you can see that here, here's ACE and here's the antibody, it's below and blocks uh, by a different mechanism. So what we've learned is that there are four classes of antibodies that interfere with ACE, some of which bind to complementary sites. Why is that important? Well, um, let's get to why it's important and forget the summary for a second. You can always look at these slides later. It's important because these viruses, even though they have um, a replicase uh, that corrects errors, um, there's enough of this virus around that every single kind of error that you can imagine is present somewhere in the population. Um, and if you're going to use antibodies for therapies, uh, you want to be sure that you don't create variants that are antibody resistant. And so one question is, can you do that? And this is the work uh, in Paul Binesh's lab um, from Fabian Schmidt. What he did was to create a replication competent virus that had the S spike from uh, the coronavirus. And then he grew that in the presence of these potent neutralizing antibodies at very high concentrations, serially passaging them. This is what this looks like. On the left, no antibody. So tons and tons of virus. On the right, you can see little spots like that where there seemed to be some virus. And in fact, that's a colony. And in fact, that colony is completely resistant to one of the antibodies that it was grown in. So here's the control, they're all sensitive. Here are three antibodies. One of them, the one that it was grown in is completely resistant. And it's completely resistant because of mutations exactly in the antibody combining site. If you use two antibodies on, on the other hand, two that are complementary, well, then there's no escape in this system or in systems that have been developed by other scientists that are really very, very similar. So everybody gets this answer. Combining two antibodies prevents the emergence of resistance. All right, so the human uh, anti-RBD antibodies, they can select for resistant variants. Uh, the resistant mutations map to antibody target sites and combinations present, prevent them. And these same resistant variants already exist in the population. We know that from the database of uh, circulating coronaviruses. All right, so everybody's interested in the possibility that antibodies will also work for uh, prevention and potentially for therapy. There are several animal models uh, for SARS coronavirus. The gold standard to date are hamsters uh, because uh, they develop a lethal infection uh, and macaques are also uh, being used for this. So this experiment uh, that I'm gonna show you was done by um, uh, Richard Bowen in hamsters. And there's really two kinds of experiments here. One is you give the antibody combination and it's going to be a combination now because of this resistance problem before you infect the animals. The peak of the infection, so this is a very rapid infection, the peak of the infection is at three days, and that's when you do the assay. And the assay in this case is measuring actual virus by plaque formation. It's not RNA, um, which can be present in cells and not necessarily produce active virus, but it's the actual virus. The second experiment is therapy. Now there's only three days in this experiment. 
So the animals are infected and then they're given the antibodies a short time later, just 12 hours. Uh, but because the, ex the uh, virus is explosive, there isn't a lot of time for the antibodies to act. What's the result? Okay, so here you can see that in the control animals, you get 10 to the sixth plaque forming units, million viruses in the small bit of tissue that was assayed in the lung. If you do prevention, and these are different doses in milligrams per kilogram in a titration, you can see that there is pretty much sterilizing protection here at these two doses, with the exception of this one animal. And then you start seeing breakthrough. So that's not surprising that the antibodies can prevent infection. What is really um, more surprising is that even within a short period of time, there is sterilizing therapy uh, at the high doses of antibodies. So uh, this is a potential uh, clinical intervention um, for uh, people that are early in, in their infection. This is an experiment that was done in macaques. Um, and um, here, the animals are uh, treated with the antibodies first and then infected. So this is again, the prevention experiment. And this is a dose response. So again, multiple doses, milligrams per kilogram of the combination of antibodies that are complementary to each other. And you can see that there is in fact a dose response. The control is the red line. The two higher doses are sterilizing. Um, and then the lower dose, uh, you can see that there's some breakthrough, uh, but a much, um, much uh, shorter uh, infection. And um, uh, most importantly, if you look at the lungs of these animals, and that's done by the way you do this is the pathologists um, look at these slides blinded from the lung. And the lung is where you really, this whole thing really matters and score it. And um, what you find is again, uh, that um, even in a therapeutic modality shown here, um, the antibodies are really uh, quite effective. So the antibodies can prevent infection and they can treat infection if given early. All right, so I'm gonna summarize um, and, and leave some time for questions, if there are questions. What we've done, um, and uh, you know, several other groups uh, as well, uh, is to recruit uh, individuals um, to give samples, human samples, to study their immune responses to this virus. What we've learned is that everyone has the ability to produce antibodies that are uh, neutralizing for this virus. Uh, and that many humans use the same kinds of antibodies uh, for this purpose. We've learned that there are at least four different classes of antibodies based on their mechanisms of, of action. Um, and that some of these antibodies are complementary to each other in terms of their binding sites. We've learned from animal experiments that the antibodies are effective both for protection and for therapy. And um, the idea that antibodies could be useful in the clinic is being pursued by multiple different pharmaceutical companies. Um, and I've listed some of them here. The ones that are furthest along in the clinic and that we hear the most about are the antibodies from Lilly uh, and uh, from uh, Regeneron. And with that, I just wanna say that um, this kind of work um, is, is a collaborative effort um, by, by really many different laboratories with different expertise. So in our case, um, 
we had a, a clinical group at Rockefeller headed by Marina Kasky and her colleagues uh, that really um, was able to rapidly recruit uh, these individuals uh, that were recovered uh, from the coronavirus. That's probably one of the hardest parts of this whole thing. Uh, in, in my own lab, um, we did uh, a lot of the work on the antibody cloning um, and initial testing. And um, Paul Beanash uh, was a virologist and the people in his lab uh, developed the assays for neutralization that we were rapidly able to use. Um, in the Bowen, Barrage, and Von Rampe labs, uh, did all of the uh, animal experiments um, uh, that I've told you about. And the critical structural work was done in Pamela Bjorkman's lab uh, at Caltech. So with that, I'm happy to take, um, take questions. Thank you very much, Michelle, for a talk on the real front line of research and technology applied to this um, in COVID-19 antibodies. I mean, we got many, many questions. I mean, I don't think we will address them all, but I will start shooting at you and we welcome uh, your answers. I mean, mechanistically, and, and I know you did a lot of work on this, is that the, the aminase works selectively on DNA encoding for the antibody? And if so, how? I mean, you, you many years of your career were destined into this question. Um, yeah, you know, uh, Fukundo, um, the, the deaminase uh, prefers a, a particular sequence um, in DNA. That's, that's not our work, it's work of other people. Um, and exactly how it's targeted to the antibody is not clear. What is clear is that it makes mistakes uh, and hits other parts of the genome uh, that facilitate um, chromosome translocations or um, hit oncogenes uh, like CNIC. You know, the antibody cannot be uh, entirely sequence specific because if it were entirely uh, sequence specific, this enzyme AID, uh, you'd always make the same mutations. And that's something that you want to avoid. You want to make as many different kinds of mutations as you can to be able to diversify the antibody. So um, you need it to be not entirely specific. And because you need it to be that way, you create all of these additional problems. Thank you very much for that. And another question is, do antibody responses from common respiratory viruses provide any immunity against SARS-CoV-2? You know, that's debated. Um, so, um, but it's my understanding that to date, the data is such that it, it probably doesn't. Uh, in fact, um, you know, the common cold coronaviruses, there's this really beautiful experiment that was just recently published in Nature Medicine about this and how long uh, you get protection. Uh, so uh, there was a cohort of people that had been followed. They were HIV infected, but uh, treated and so pretty normal uh, in, in, in nearly all respects. Um, these people were followed for many, many years uh, and um, had, there were samples from these people over 30 years um, that were then tested for their reactivity to coronaviruses. And um, if you get an infection, you get a bump in the antibody response. So what was found is that these people would get bumps in the antibody response after a year. Uh, so infection one, one year later, infection two. So even for common cold coronaviruses, um, people are not protected for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And certainly doesn't seem to be any crosslink uh, that's significant. A question that Kevin raised is, I am wondering how do we know that Worse coronavirus in 19 course or longer exposure to the virus cause higher antigen neutralization activity as opposed to higher neutralization activity cause worse uh, in the disease due to immunity. Yeah, you could, you could um, that's exactly right. So you, you might uh, say, okay, hey, look, the people that are worse off uh, 
uh, they have more antibodies. So maybe the antibodies are making them worse. Um, there's, there's really no data to support that kind of um, idea, including the fact that uh, thousands and thousands of people have been given antibodies, a plasma therapy, uh, and nothing bad happens. Then another question uh, from Daniel is that are there are diseases that antibody are infected against uh, that we can develop alternative ways of vaccines that will confer long-term immunity? I'm not sure I understand that question. Can you... The question is, can we elicit vaccines that are not depending on antibodies? I mean, there they are is... not depending on antibodies. Yes, correct. Um, well, you know, there's a whole um, T cell component to most vaccines. Uh, in fact, you cannot make antibodies without um, T cells, or you can't make good antibodies without T cells. So, T cells are important aspects of. Um, most vaccines as well, or, or all vaccines as well. But by themselves, they typically do not prevent pathogen entry. So the way they see the antigen requires that the pathogen get into the cell first, or that the pathogen be processed. So you have to start an infection in order for the T cell to see it at all which is bad news because then you're paying catch up. You've started something and then you have to get rid of it as opposed to the antibody, which is going to prevent the thing from happening in the first place. So in theory, uh, the T cell is not going to be effective at all in preventing an infection. It could stop an infection once you start it but that's a bad place to start. Another question is, you have suggested that most of infected individuals show low neutralizing efficiency. Does this mean that they are susceptible to be reinfected? We don't know that. Um, it may be that even very low levels of polyclonal antibodies are sufficient uh, to, to protect people. And in the study that I mentioned earlier, about the coronavirus, uh, common cold coronaviruses, just because you're infected again, doesn't mean that you're going to be sick. Um, so if you have some pre-existing level of immunity and have those clones that can respond faster and better, you may become infected, um, but you may resolve the infection um, much more quickly. So that's the, like the T-cell thing that I just mentioned. And here is, uh, Peyton is putting a, a speculative question. He's, he's saying, that since all people are able to generate these antibodies, could immunogen be generated in combination to vaccine and drive the generation of all these neutralizing antibodies specifically? Yeah, I mean, the, the immunogens that are being tested are in fact focused on uh, trying to elicit these kinds of antibodies, yes. And um, finally, I mean, just a general question. I mean, you, you put this model in which uh, plasma cells and memory cells are coming out of the germinal center over time. Does this mean that the affinity of them is different? Meaning? Yeah. The, the... So the way that this gets, you know, the more sophisticated things, but the way that the cells are selected, uh, plasma cells are selected basically is um, by interaction with uh, T cells. And the T cell is the one that determines whether the B lymphocyte has um, sufficient affinity um, by mechanisms that actually Facundo worked out uh, when he was a postdoc with Michael Neuberger. The, the B cells actually has, with a high affinity antibody, can actually capture the antigen, pull it off of uh, its immune complexes on FTC, on follicular dendritic cells, and ingest it. And the cell that really grabs the most can show it to the T cell, and the T cell looks around and says, okay, you've got the most antigen, you become a plasma cell. Uh, that's how that decision is made. 
the decision about memory is far more complex. We understand far less about it, but it doesn't require that the cell have a high affinity. In fact, low affinity cells are going into the memory compartment um, better than high affinity cells. And probably we have time for the last question is how do viral diversity and viral mutation rate specifically for COVID-2 compare to antibody clonal diversity and mutation rate? Uh, gee, uh, I think the antibodies are probably mutating better than the virus. Um, uh, the virus certainly mutates, um, even though its mutation is, rate is, is really quite low. But as I said, if you look in the database now, there are mutations in everywhere on this virus. Um, so um, even though the mutation rate itself is low, uh, remember that people, just one individual, can have 10 to the 10th viral particles in a nasal swab. So imagine how many viruses that is in a person and imagine how many people are infected. So even though the mutation rate is low, the viral burden is so high that you have everything. Michelle, on behalf of uh, Richard and Lena and all the students and all the audience, we would like to really thank you for this wonderful talk today and to put you at really at the forefront of scientific discovery. Thank you very, very much. My great pleasure, Fukundo. Thank you.